It's Thursday. I'm off work early. I have a four day weekend. Christmas is right around the corner. And here's the awesome thing. Today is the last day where Thunder Valley Casino is doing their promo for the holiday season leading up to Christmas where they're giving away free stuff every hour at the poker room. So today, every single hour, they're giving away $400 to one lucky person playing and two lucky people are, are gonna win an electronics package worth $4,000. So I'm definitely gonna play today. We're gonna head out there and I already checked out Bravo. It's only 2.30, I just got off work and there's already 12 table runnings. Last time I went out there in the middle of the week, there was like three or four tables running. So I guarantee all the regs are out there. Everybody that plays there is there trying to get their shot and their chance at winning this promo. So yeah, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to head out there. I'm going to go pick up my mom because she wants me to pick her up from my sister's house since she's over there watching her kids. Then I'm going to drive to their house, pick up my dad, and we're going to head out there and we're going to get on the tables. So hopefully I'll get lucky. Either me or my dad will win some extra money off of their promo or we'll just have fun playing poker. So I'll see you guys out there in a little bit. Got about an hour to burn before it's time for me to head out. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take care of some chores. Even though I hate doing chores, gotta do it right. It's part of owning a house. So I think I'm gonna vacuum. I need to vacuum upstairs, vacuum the office. Gonna do that. And then I'm gonna get into the poker mindset. So I'm gonna log on to Ignition. I actually already have it open over here on my computer. So we're gonna log some hands playing some speed poker on Zoom. I'm gonna try to get anywhere between 100 and 200 hands before I go. Just playing some five and over fun. And then we'll head on out and we'll get on some live tables. So yeah, let's get to the chores. So we ended up getting to the casino around 6.30 and luckily I called in ahead of time because I knew they were super busy. There were currently 14 tables running when I called in and got on the wait list when there are five people on the wait list for 3.6. Luckily when we got there they had just recently opened up a new table 3.6 so there were a lot of seats open throughout the card room because people were moving over to different games as they opened up. So luckily we were able to sit down directly into a game right when we got there. I bought in for 140, just under 50 big blinds. And my dad and I ended up going our separate ways onto different tables. I ended up playing around a three and a half hour session, booked a small win, and really enjoyed myself. It was very festive. There were a lot of people out there enjoying themselves, having a good time, getting an early start on the holiday weekend, and definitely a younger crowd, even at the 3 6 games. Um, a lot of semi bluffing and bluffing going on in these games as well, which typically don't occur when I play against an older crowd. So I really enjoyed myself, and that's really what I'm looking for when I go out and I play these games and these live games in the evenings rather than staying at home. So I ended up recording a fair amount of hands. Um, I didn't record all of them because it's a lot of hands to record in three and a half hours and my phone battery would go dead. But I think I got some pretty good hands and some pretty good action in here. So let's go ahead and let's get into it and let's talk about some of the hands that I played. Early on in the session, about midway through my first orbit, I looked down at five, seven of spades and the cutoff. One of my opponents open limps and I decide to over limp with five seven of spades, a good hand to play multi ways in position to my opponent in limit poker. Button comes along, small blind folds and big blind checks and we end up going to the flop four ways. So dealer deals at the flop. The flop is a fairly favorable flop for me. I end up flopping top pair with a gut shot straight draw with a seven six three rainbow board. I lead out and button calls, everybody else folds. We end up going to the turn. The turn is a relative blank card. 
it's a deuce. It doesn't really improve my opponent unless he does have the 5-4, which I block. So I lead out again with top pair, the gut a straight draw, and he ends up going into the tank. So he thinks about it, finally mucks his hand, and I end up taking down a nice little pot. Um, this was my second win of the night. I ended up uh, chopping the pot just before that, so it's always nice to take down some hands early on in the session. So in this hand, I end up looking down at pocket nines in early position, and I open raise to six from early position. Now, this is something where people can get a bit stuck on what they should do in limit poker. With hands like pocket eights, pocket nines, and pocket tens, I think we should be open raising in early position. However, if we're in late position, there's multiple limpers already in the pot, we should just turn those hands into a set mining hand just because there's going to be a lot of bad flops. Um, we definitely don't want to take hands like pocket eights, pocket nines, and pocket tens and open limp first in. We do want to raise to try to thin out the field a little bit, even though a lot of people are going to call. Um, but I often see people open limping. I even see people open open limping pocket queens, pocket kings, and pocket aces in limit poker, which I don't like at all. It's a terrible strategy. If You don't want to be the first one in open limping strong pocket pairs like that because you lose a lot of equity when you go multi-ways. So anyways, let's get back to the hand. So I end up open raising, and we end up getting three different colors. So two people in position to me, and the big blind decides to come along. Now we go to the flop. The flop is a king five deuce rainbow. Not really a great flop for me. Big blind decides to check. I check as well. And my two remaining opponents decide to check back as well, which is a good sign for me, which tells me it's very unlikely that any of them have a king. The dealer goes ahead and deals out the turn. The turn is another king, which is a great card for me because now the possibility of my opponents having a king just decreases very much. So half the kings are on the board, so their combinations of kings decrease by 50%. So the odds that I have the best hand goes up a lot. I end up getting a caller. We end up going to the river. The river's a great card. It's a five. It double pairs the board with kings and fives. I'm hoping that it'll call me down with an ace high or a smaller pocket pair, uh, maybe even a queen. Um, and so I end up betting, hands up mucking, ended up showing him pocket nines, and we take down that pot. In this hand, we end up looking down at a really good premium hand. We end up getting big slick suited in middle position. So it folds around us. We open raise to six, typically something we would definitely want to be doing with our premiums. And everybody else ends up folding except for the small blind. Small blind, who is a fairly active opponent. Um, he's somebody that's been playing in a lot of pots. For an online player, I would give him a VPIP of close to around 70%. So he's been super active. However, he's been very aggressive with semi-bluffs as well, and also value betting middle pair, value betting really thin. So um, I'm very happy to be in a pot with an opponent like him. So we end up going to the flop heads up. It's a very favorable flop. The flop is a king high dry board texture. I believe it was like a king nine um, low card with a rainbow. So with top pair top kicker, I fire out a continuation bet for value. He calls very quickly. He checks the turn. It's a blank. Again, I lead out for value. He calls very quickly and we go to the river. It's another blank card. Really doesn't change much. Really dry board texture. I fire a third barrel for value. And... He quickly mucks his hand. He just looks and throws in the muck. And we take down the pot and I show him my top pair with a pair of aces. And he says, yeah. Um, I believe he told me that he ended up having a middle pair that he ended up folding. In this hand, we are in the big blind. And we end up looking down at a premium hand. We end up looking down at rockets. So by the time he gets around to us in the big blind, under the gun limps. Several people also limp into the hand, and we look at aces, so of course we raise it to six. And everybody that's in the hand decides to come along and decides to call. So we end up going to the flop multi-ways. I would say it was either five or six ways. Uh, the flop is a pretty favorable flop. It ends up being jack nine four rainbow so we get value from people that have straight draws we get value from people that have top pair we get value from really um stationary people and sticky people that have middle pair so of course we lead out for value with our pair of bases with over pair and opponent directly to my left throws out a raise fairly quickly 
It folds all the way back around to me. Of course I call. Um, when he makes this move, I am a bit weary of my hand. Yes, he could have a set of nines, a set of jacks. However, he has been a somewhat of an aggressive opponent in limit, um, but I have seen him limp in with premiums as well. However, sometimes he's raising them. So I think he has combos of jacks sometimes. He definitely has combos of pocket nines, four sets of nines, and he also has um, combinations for the set of fours as well. So we do have to be worried about him having sets. We also have to be worried about him having two pairs, such as jack nine. However, he can also have something like an open ended straight draw where he's trying to play aggressively against me. Um, now he could also have top pair top, top kicker, and he should be raised. He could potentially be raising for value with that, but I don't know how often somebody at limit will be doing that. So he bets. I do call. Um, the turn ends up being a blank. I check. He bets. I call. And the river is a king. I check. And he ends up betting. And I think this is where I, I end up making a mistake here on the river um, when he, he continues to fire these barrels on multiple streets, especially when the king comes. I think I should be folding this river. However, getting the pot odds that I'm getting in plain limit where um, if we add up the pot, it's going to be very favorable pot odds, probably something like 7 to 1 or like um, 8 to 1 on my money where I only have to win somewhere between like 11% to 15% of the time. However, I don't know if I even win that much of the time when my opponent just keeps barreling into me. So I end up do making the call, but I'm very wary of the call. And he ends up showing pocket nines. He ends up flopping a set of nines. So, I mean, that's, I guess that's really the dilemma of playing limit is that you're getting such great pot outs to call. But even on a dry board texture like that, where um, you think, well, I only need to win this, this much. Um, but what is my opponent really just barreling into me on several streets after he raises, especially when the king hits the board on the river? So I think I make a mistake by calling the river, but I, I just don't think, you know, I don't think it could be faulted for calling that river either. But um, I think in a perfect world, if I really thought about it very analytically, which I really wasn't um, playing the game, I was having fun and enjoying the game and playing with them. Um, and it was more of a social game, I decided to call but I think if I was playing a game where the stakes were higher and I was really thinking about his range, that probably should be a fold on the river because I'm going to look down at one, two pair at the worst, and or two, a set. Um, and it ended up being a set. Now, on a side note, this is actually kind of funny because I was talking to this guy. He was a nice guy. Um, it reminded me of a hand in Las Vegas. So several years ago, during one of my trips to Las Vegas, me and my buddy are about to leave. We get to the airport. And we're there for hours. We're there for like three hours. They're delaying our flight. They end up canceling our flight because of bad weather. It's too windy. And so they tell us the flight's canceled. Come back tomorrow. And because it's due to weather and not the airline, they don't give us any sort of a comp to stay at a hotel room. So we're stuck. We have to figure out where we're going to stay. Um, I get into one of those kiosks at the hotels. This is back in the early 2000s. When, um, you know, not everybody had a tablet and a smartphone around with them everywhere. Not everybody had an iPhone. Not everybody had a laptop. We didn't have all that. So I went over to one of those where you pay per minute for a kiosk. Quickly found us a cheap room at Hooters. We were, um, at the time, we were kind of semi-broke, um, you know, guys in our mid-20s. We had already spent a bunch of money in Vegas. And so I just found us a cheap room in Hooters. And I told my buddy, hey, this is actually kind of serendipitous because we didn't really get a chance to check out WSOP. This was in June. It was my birthday month. And WSOP was running. So I told my buddy, let's get a room. Um, let's go check out WSOP. We'll just keep a car for another night. And then we'll go play some poker. So we ended up getting a room, checking in, and it was just at the Hooters back in the days. This room was just a dump. I mean, it was just terrible. I hated it. I don't know how it is now because I haven't stayed there since, but I think it was like 30 or 40 bucks. I mean, I guess, what do you expect, right? It's somewhere to lay your head at night. So we end up going over to watch the WSOP. We end up watching the WSOP for a while. It was pretty cool um, walking around the room and checking out everything. They had on t the top stage in the convention hall, um, they ended up having at the Rio in that big area, they had a final table running. I don't know what it was. I didn't notice anybody, but you could actually go up there and they really didn't have a rail so it must have been a smaller event and we ended up watching that for a bit then we ended up going over to the mgm to play one two no limit i didn't have that much money left and um in one hand i end up looking down at pocket aces an opponent raises in early position i three bet with pocket aces um he calls 
and we end up getting in on the flop and of course he flops a set of nines and so I was telling this guy because it was kind of funny I ended up getting stacked with aces and it just reminded me of that Vegas trip and I told him about it and he gave me a chuckle and I said hey at least it was only limit and I only lost 24 bucks so it's not that big of a deal but anyways yeah that was kind of like I guess a side note kind of went off on a tangent but just reminded me of a funny story in Vegas where our flight got canceled. We thought it was going to be serendipitous because we could check out WSOP, and I ended up getting cooler for the rest of my money. I was kind of broke. I really wasn't rolled to play 1-2 in Vegas, but I was playing anyways because I was having fun in my early 20s. I ended up at Coolert, lost the rest of my money, and um, pretty much called it a, a trip with my gambling and ended up going home with an empty wallet for poker. But anyways, uh, yeah, let's jump into the next hand. In this hand, we're in the big blind, and we look down, and we look down at a very nice hand in the big blind. So, big blind special, ace-king offsuit, and by the time it gets to us, there are two opponents that have limped in. A small blind decides to fold, I raise it up to six, and the aggressive opponent that's been playing a lot of hands with me, the guy that I said had around a 70% B-pip, he decides to call. The other person, an older gentleman, decides to fold. The flop is not the best flop in the world. It's not the worst flop in the world. It's an 885 flop. So I think I could have the best hand. However, I don't know how much fold equity I have in limit. So I decide to check out of position, and he checks back. Um, and the turn is interesting. It double pairs the board. So now it's 8855. And at this point in time, I decide to check back again. However, I think I make a mistake here. I think I should be betting here for value because. If he has any sort of a pair, I'm assuming he probably would have bet the flop. And on the turn with ace high, I think I can bet for value because pocket or a pair of eights and a pair of fives with two pairs on the board with an ace kicker is probably going to be the best hand. I check back. He checks back again. And the river is another eight. So there's a full house on the board. At this point in time, we're chopping. He's not folding. I'm not folding. We don't want to bloat the pot with more rake. So we end up checking it down. I show Ace King, and he shows 610 suited. So I ended up get, letting him get to showdown where I should have bet the turn and made him fold his 10 high. And I would have taken down the pot. So I think it was a mistake on my end. However, do I think he would have folded there with his double paired with a 10 over? I don't know. This guy's been pretty active. He's been making a lot of calls. Um, so it's hard to say, but I do think that was a mistake. But we end up chopping the pot. So it's not a huge deal. In this hand, we are in, I would say, middle to late position, middle position plus two or middle position plus one. I look down at Jack 10 offsuit, perfectly playable implied odds hand for a table that's playing multi ways. So I limp in, button calls, small blind completes, big blind checks, and we end up going to the flop. Um, on the flop, it's a fairly favorable flop, small blind checks, big blind bets, and we look down, the flop board texture is jack 9-7 rainbow. So we end up flopping top pair with a gutter for the jack high straight draw. So of course, we decide to call our opponent in the big blind, the person that decides to lead out. This is an opponent that we've been playing a lot of hands with. He's been fairly active. This is an opponent that I said has around a 70% V-pip that's been semi-bluffing a lot, and he's been value betting very thinly. So I make the call fairly quickly, button calls, small blind calls as well. So nobody folds. Um, we end up going to the turn. The turn is, is a fairly non-consequential card. It really doesn't change much. It's a five. So if we still think we had the best hand, then we do have the best hand. Big blind bets again. I call fairly quickly. I think about it for a few seconds, and then I make the call. Um, and then the person on the button decides to time bank it. So he time banks for a while, he mucks his hand, and the small blind mucks his hand as well. We go to the river, the river is a deuce, big blind checks, I decide to check because I have good showdown value, he shows 9-10, he ended up flopping the straight draw of the gutter as well, but he ends up having middle pair, and my top pair is good, and we take down the pot. In this hand, we are in the cutoff, and we look down at a good playable implied odds hand, 8-9 suited. So there's already a limper in the pot. We decide to overlimp with a great implied odds hand that can make a lot of playable hands and also a lot of nutted hands that are going to get good implied odds off of opponents that have top pair type of hands. So we limp, and button limps in, small blind completes, big blind checks, 
And the flop is a fairly favorable flop. So the flop is a nine high with the tune totem board texture with a flush draw. So a club high flush draw with a pair of nines. It checks around to me in the cutoffs. Three people check. I look down, I have top pair with a decent kicker. So I bet for protection. Now, I don't think I always have the best hand, but I think I have the best hand at decent frequency at the time. And I also get calls from flush draws as well as people that have potentially backdoor straight draws on a low board texture like that. So I bet out um, and we end up, I believe, getting a couple of colors. So uh, we get a fold from the button, small blind calls, big blind folds, and an opponent to my left that limped in calls as well. We go to the turn. The turn is a relative blank. It's another low card. It doesn't complete a straight draw or a flush draw. Both of my opponents check. I bet for value. And my opponent to my left goes ahead, he tanks, he thinks about it, he folds his hand, the, and the opponent directly to my right, he decides to call. We go to the river, the river is an off-suited ace, it's a really great card for me, so we end up getting an off-suited ace on the river, which ends up giving us top two pair. My opponent really can't have much at this point um, with two pair. Top two pair, actually, I end up betting, he folds, and I end up showing down top two pair, and we take down that pot. So for the last hand that I recorded for the session that I want to talk about, um, I end up looking down at a good hand. I look down at king, queen, suited of clubs in late position, about middle position plus one or middle position plus two. Um, there's already a limper in the pot. I don't think it's strong enough to raise, so I decide to call instead. Cut off folds, button calls. Um, and small blind, which is the aggressive opponent that's been playing in a lot of pots, the one that I said has around a 70% V-pip, he decides to raise it up to six. And big blind fold, the person that originally limped in calls, and me being in position, knowing how aggressive he's been so far, um, I decide to make the call. However, I'm not too happy at this point in time, um, just because I know I can be dominated a lot when he's raising here. And also, Button decides to make the call as well. We go to the flop. The flop is a pretty good flop, um, and it's a king high flop with a couple low cards. He leads out, and at this point in time, when he leads out into three opponents, I'm a bit worried about my hand. Um, I'm, I'm really thinking in my head, he must have ace king or pocket aces, um, simply because I block um, king queen. Um, I don't think he would be raising with King Jack just because I've seen how he's played so far. Um, but I make the call nonetheless with top pair. Um, and both of the other opponents make the call as well. We end up going to the turn and he ends up firing a continuation bet on the turn as well. And the turn is a jack, which really isn't a great card either because now if he has pocket jacks, he has a set of jacks as well. We really don't beat that either. Um, we don't beat King Jack. We only chop with the King Queen and we lose to Ace King. But again, knowing how aggressive he's been so far, I'm not folding. So I make the call, button folds, um, and I believe the other opponent folded as well. We go to the river. It's just a relative blank river card. Um, again, he fires a third barrel. So he bets again, and I think for a minute, I kind of tank and think, well, um, should I make the call? And I make the call, and he ends up showing up with pocket nines. He was just trying to make me fold. Um, and I show down with top pair and take it down. So against any other opponent, I, I think against um, most opponents, somebody that probably isn't as aggressive to him, I might actually fold that river. But just knowing how he's played so far, and I saw him playing so many hands where he was bluffing a lot and semi-bluffing a lot um, and value betting very thinly uh, several times with middle pair that I felt like that was a pretty standard call against him. However, against other opponents at the table, I actually made some pretty nitty folds. I folded top pair. Um, I've seen people actually, one guy uh, sitting a couple seats to uh, his left um, ended up open limping pocket kings. He luckily won that hand. Another hand, he ended up flopping the flush with 5-6 suited or 5-7 suited. Um, and he ended up check calling the flop um, and ended up checking down to the river, um, playing it very passively. But I knew that that guy only played with nutted hands and stayed in the pots with nutted hands. So against him, I was folding. But against this guy, I mean, just knowing the way that he played, um, I think it was a fairly standard call. And we ended up taking down that hand. So after around three and a half hours of play, I decided to call it quits because I didn't want to stay that long. Even though I was enjoying myself, I knew that I had to get my dad home and still drive home after then. I didn't want to be out on the freeways too late. Um, but I really enjoyed myself. I had a fun time playing there 
at Thunder Valley Casino and playing 3-6. It was just a, an enjoyable experience, and I really enjoyed the company of the people around me, and that's really why I go to play live poker. I don't play for you know profits and to build up a bankroll and to try to, to earn a side income. That's really not why I'm playing these games. I'm not playing these games for that. But on a side note, I am getting an itch. I'm getting an itch to start playing no limit. So I'm thinking about trying to make a run at building up my bankroll um, by playing online, by playing multi tables of 25 and L to build up my role, and also um, more live poker as well. So yeah, you know, that's the goal. That's, that's really what I'd like to do. Um, you know, and we'll really see where it takes me. Now, in terms of this session, after around three and a half hours of play, um, things went pretty well. So I was up and I was down. Early on, I actually got up pretty quick and I was up to around, you know, $40 up. But then it was just kind of, you know, a, a rocky road where I was going up and down, up and down, up and down, you know, where I'd win some and lose some. And I was down 40 at some time, but I was never really down that far. And in the end, I ended up booking a small profit. I ended up winning um, $48, which is, you know, perfectly fine by me. Um, on the downside, unfortunately, my dad ended up losing um, close to $140, not running so well. So, you know, I feel, feel bad for him, but it's, you know, nice for me to book a small win here and there. Um, so, yeah. Anyways, thanks for watching today's vlog, um, and uh, we'll see you at the next episode.